Thanks, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. So um, the webinar today is uh, second in our series of three. So just a little bit, bit about myself, as Greg said, I'm a Beef Extension Officer based in Rockhampton, so I'm one of the team here, and we work in the areas of uh, breeder management, cattle nutrition, genetics and grazing management. Um, and naturally, supplementation and nutrition is a pretty important part of what we do. So Kylie and I in this series of webinars have distilled um, quite a few years of experience in this area and um, different types of presentation activities into the, what we think are the key messages. So um, last week, Kylie covered the sort of um, fundamentals and background information, which is the key points about practical cattle nutrition, the concept of limiting nutrients, the role that legumes can play in improving diet quality and the fundamental importance of pasture intake in determining animal performance. So today I want to um, look at the um, area of herd management and nutrition uh, because there is considerable opportunity to um, reduce supplementation costs as well as get better cattle performance by how you structure and manage the herd. And then next week we'll be moving into more detail about how you actually go about choosing and managing different types of supplements. So um, just a bit of a plug for some upcoming events. We've got a series of days on in central Queensland in September and October there. And then in southern Queensland, there's some on in November where we'll be going into more detail than we can possibly cover in, in webinars. And also we found these days tremendous opportunity for people to learn from each other because there's you know, a lot of wise heads come along to these days and yeah, we find the discussions extremely good. Um, so moving on to today, um, I've put up here the monthly rainfall data for Emerald and um, what I'm trying to highlight here is that the seasonal pattern that we see in um, pretty typical of Northern Australia, apologies to people in Southern Australia that I haven't presented any Southern rainfall data, but basically the principles the same, that we have periods when rainfall is reasonably reliable and quite good, such as January, February, then it pretty smartly drops off into the winter months here where, you know, the rainfall isn't very high and we can't really be relying too much on it to give us a body of feed. Then of course, come October, November, we we've got a expectation that we're going to start receiving some more rain. But in most cases, Northern Australia, until you hit December, um, you haven't really got much expectation of useful rain. Um, and I'll go into that in more detail in a minute. So the, the critical thing with setting up breeders and, and managing them plus cattle generally is, is appreciating this seasonal pattern and trying to work with it rather than trying to um, fight it. Um, so diet quality is closely related to the season. Um, Kylie demonstrated last week how that protein becomes our first limiting nutrient, then energy. Um, basically, I think these three pictures here show the progression we're all familiar with, that December, January, February, it might be like the top picture. Middle of the year, it'll be getting like the middle one. And then from now on, it's starting often getting fairly ordinary. Um, you know, not much colour left in grass, um, poor quality. And the other important point is that wet cows on this dry season grass, as in the bottom picture, they are invariably below maintenance for protein and energy until the season breaks. And that's the fundamental challenge we've got with breeder management and nutrition is that um, there's no way around it. If they carve on that sort of grass, their diet is below maintenance for their needs. And um, basically we can influence that to a certain degree by the time of carving, but most people are aiming to carve around the end of the dry season. So invariably there is a period there when animals have to face at some time on below maintenance diet and that can't be avoided. Um, it doesn't matter, drought doesn't really change it. All the drought does is it starts sooner and goes longer. Um, so we could think about trying to fill that energy gap. And basically if you have a 450 kilo cow, 
once she's um, wet, the difference between what she's getting out of relatively poor dry season grass, like in that bottom picture, and what she needs is about 36 megajoules of energy, which um, isn't far off half her daily requirements, which just highlights the magnitude of the problem that these animals are up against at the end of the dry season when they start lactating. We could attempt to fill that gap, but it would require 4.1 kilos of molasses, 3.4 kilos of sorghum, or 3.3 kilos of copper meal. And none of them are very cheap. And I think, you know, it's well established that the, the strength of grazing cattle and sheep is their ability to utilize relatively poor quality pasture. Um, we're not on the right track if we try and replace grass with purchase feed. So we've got to go about managing them so they can handle this period of poor quality nutrition. So this just presents a bit more information on the magnitude of this energy and protein deficit these cows face. So this is a representation of some of the figures Kylie went through last week, just to refresh your memories. But on that sort of poor quality dry season grass, they're the deficits of protein and energy that our dry cow in the last trimester faces. Um, and this is what our lactating cow faces. And that 36 megajoules of energy deficit is a quite a handicap for them. If we give them some uh, dry season supplement as in a urea type lick, we can improve the situation quite a bit. And with a dry cow, we just about get her to maintenance. An energy deficit of seven megajoules isn't all that great if the cow has reasonable body condition. And we see it all the time that the dry cows travel log quite well until they calve and then the condition starts to come off them. But even with the dry lick and feeding them 150 grams of protein to help utilize that poor quality grass, this wet cow's got a, diff, um, a deficit of 27 megajoules. A pretty common um, feed throughout, um, you know, northern, central, southeast Queensland is M8U. It's been a great standby for a long time for dry season drought feeding. And a pretty common feeding rate of that is two kilos of that a day, which will supply about 16 megajoules. So with a dry cow, we actually can get her into probably just a fraction above maintenance. Whereas our wet cow, she's still got a considerable deficiency in terms of energy and protein. Um, that is obviously, she's in a better position than if you're not giving her MAU, but even with a relatively high quality and no longer cheap supplement, we still got her in a deficit situation, hence the importance of how we manage her. Um, last year, that sort of supplementation, two kilos of MAU a day, would have cost in central Queensland in the order of 16 to 20 dollars a head a month depending on uh, what you're buying your molasses and your rear at so it's good but it's no longer a cheap option um, so the way to fight this situation is body condition um, there's no way around it breeders require body condition reserves to handle this dry season period when the diet is below maintenance um, most people would be familiar with the concept of body condition scores. It's talked about all the time in breeder management. So there's some example photos we've got for sort of red bosindicus type cattle ranging from poor through to fat. And this is the area we wanna be operating in body condition store and forward store, operating down poor backward store animals, um, yeah, they, they're going to struggle to perform for you and they, they present a, a, a drought and welfare risk too. So the sort of pregnancy rates we will expect with animals in different body condition is shown in this table here. And the important thing is the condition they're in when they carve at the end of the dry season. So if they carve in store condition, um, we're probably going to get a pregnancy rate at this following mating of 40 to 80 percent. Now, that's a very big range, and that comes about because a lot depends on the season you actually get. 
Um, if the season breaks late, obviously things aren't going to be as good as if you get a good break in November, early December. But the main point of this is that when they're in store and forward store condition, or even if they're fat, we can look forward to pretty reasonable reconception rates. But if they're back in poor and backward store condition when they carve, our expectation isn't very good on the sort of conception rates we're going to get. So there's some photos from um, cows near Cloncurry. Um, that's about November. Calves are just hitting the ground and um, those cows are in really good shape. And um, that body condition on their backs is their insurance against a late seasonal break. With that amount of body condition, a good body of dry grass and some urea supplement, they can go a long time before there's problems. And the value of the body condition on their fat in terms of nutritional value, I think is well illustrated when we think about the energy content of fat. It's about 27 megajoules of metabolized energy per kilo. Molasses is 8.7 and whole cottonseed, which is one of the best feeds we could ever use is 13. So yeah, there's an awful lot of energy tied up in their fat, which if we manage them so they can utilize it safely, um, it can go a long way to avoiding having to resort to expensive energy supplements um, and also ensure that we got the best chance of having them uh, in a reasonable condition when mating's underway and we're and getting a good conception rate. Um, some other options for managing this um, dry season um, weight loss situation that these animals face is, um, last week Kylie covered off on phosphorus supplementation, which is one of the most important tools we've got um, on phosphorus deficient country. And wet season supplementation with phosphorus could lead up to a 90 kilo weight advantage um, at the end of the growing season, simply because with um, supplementary phosphorus, they're able to make better use of the feed when it's at its best quality. And that would represent over the dry season, somewhere in the order of half of that would be additional body weight reserves that they have got to utilize in the dry season. So it can make a fairly substantial difference to their performance. Um, weaning, will say five to 13 kilos of weight loss a month. Um, so over a dry season, that could be the order of 60 odd kilos. The variation in the weight saving um, is mainly influenced by the time of the weaning. Uh, weaning in March, April, early May, when feed quality is quite good, the weight saving is greater than later in the year, say August, September, October. And that's because um, the feed quality is such that once the cow stops making milk, she's able to um, put on quite a bit of weight, whereas her ability to do that in September, October is often severely constrained by the low quality of the diet. But still that weight saving in the latter part of the year can be very important in, um, in preserving body condition. And that's why in year round mated herds, um, you know, it's been pretty standard practice for a long time to do two rounds of weaning just to, you know, get calves off so cows aren't wet too long. Um, urea supplementation has been a good long-term standby for, for helping body condition, but all that can do is minimise weight loss. Um, it, it can't really put too much weight on animals and that's why we see, you know, expected benefit of urea supplementation would be the order of zero to seven kgs. That's from looking at a whole series of trials that have been done over the years. Sometimes urea will have no real benefit, like if there's a bit of green pick from out of season rain, urea isn't really going to do anything for you. Um, if you've got good quality hay or grass, the response to urea will, is much better than if you've got grass that's been affected by dew and mildew. And our high energy supplements such as MAU or whole cottonseed, we can make a considerable difference in the weight loss that animals suffer. Like we could probably potentially reduce weight loss by 15 to 25 kilos a month. But as I mentioned before, 
that two kilos of MAU is going to cost you 16 to $20 a month for a breeder in central Queensland. So, um, yeah, you're um, saving weight loss, but it's coming at a fair old cost. Um, moving on to a few um, thoughts about uh, control mating and the role that can play in setting these animals up to better handle this um, nutritional challenge they face. I think a good way to think about control mating and when you calve is to think about how long can your cows hang on for. We know that in the dry season they're facing this below maintenance diet, they've got the potential to lose a lot of weight so you know how long can your cows hang on for uh, before they get into a situation where the body condition loss is going to compromise their conception rate or it can go on from there to a point where we've got a survival issue on our hands. So if a cow calves on the 1st of July, it's 209 days to the 26th of January. And it's not unusual to have a seasonal break in a lot of Queensland not arrive until the end of January. So that's a very long time for an animal to be on a below maintenance diet. Um, and that is an issue with calves that come you know, very early. 1st of September, of course, it's quite a bit shorter. And if they calve on the 1st of November, you know, they only potentially face 87 days of that very poor quality diet. So um, the time of calving is all about preventing animals lactating for too long on that dry season feed. And it also has to be thought about in terms of our grazing management and, the, and the, our body condition management. We've got to manage both the cattle and the country so we can handle that late break because it does happen quite regularly. Um, an important concept that we think about when uh, planning mating times and that is the green date. And there's a number of ways people define this, but the one we tend to work with is that, um, when can you expect a, a fall of rain of over a maximum of three days, say after the 1st of September when you know, we're at the peak of the dry season. How long do we have to wait before we get enough rain to produce good, fresh new growth? Um, at Emerald, if you thought, right, 25 millimetres will get me started, which may well work on light country, but of course on heavy black soil, you're really going to need 50 odd millimetres. So in 50% of years at Emerald, we will get 50 millimetres by the 22nd of December. But often we suggest that people work to a 70% of years as their planning horizon. And so we're saying from the data that you've got a 70% chance of having had that 50 millimetres at Emerald by the 10th of January. Um, and that's what we have to keep in mind. Like it's quite possible you'll get the 50 millimetres in October but you're more likely not to see it until well into December, early January. The other end of the season, say April, um, when the growing season's coming to an end, I think it's important to think about, well, what are my chances of getting useful rain at that point if the season has been a bit light? Um, so at Emerald, in only 17% of years, will you get 50 millimetres over a maximum of three days? So that's telling us that um, the chances of getting out of a light season with good April rain probably aren't all that good. Um, it definitely has happened and it will continue to happen every now and then, but it's not really a good strategy to be um, living on hope that it's going to happen in the year you happen to find yourself in a bit of a difficult situation. So we're trying to manage this relatively short period of um, good quality feed um, and we've um, got to set the herd up to make best use of that. Um, so factors to consider in joining times. In many cases, it's a compromise between starting too soon and finishing too late. Um, a lot of people in central Queensland, for example, like to have their calves born by December. So in some cases, by the end of December, say Christmas, in some cases, that means some of them are coming in late August, um, which might be a little earlier than desired, but you've got to just pick the best 
period that's going to suit your business because if carbs come to late, say, you know, late January into February, um, it starts to make it challenging to um, manage the, the weaning. Um, if the season's poor, you might want to come in and wean a bit sooner. Um, if you've got a lot of late calves, it can be hard to do that. Um, earlier calving is, you know, there's plenty of people around who, do, who join early and, and handle early calves, no worries. But in many cases, that is made considerably easier if you've got good country. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that on good, good scrub country than it is on forest country. Uh, lighter stocking, of course, helps because the animals have just got more feed in front of them and are able to pick a better quality diet. And if you're actively managing the body condition, which is your grazing management and the timing of your weaning, um, if your cows have got better body condition on, they can handle an early calving better. And also some people, you know, handle earlier calving by being prepared to put more supplement into them. Um, a bit of a conundrum we face, you know, if you're selling weaners, um, early calving is quite attractive because you're going to get bigger, heavier weaners when you want to sell them. But it can come at a cost in breeder condition, um, calving rates, and also the amount you might have to be prepared to spend on supplements. Um, so the message of all that, I think, with control mating is identify the months you don't want carbs and plan your joining accordingly. So, you know, a lot of people in Central Queensland, for example, you know, they don't want calves after February and they probably don't want them before September. So they set the joining up accordingly to achieve that. And that, um, just going back to that um, data there, um, that come, there's a number of um, programs you can get that from, like there's Rain Man, and there's also the Climate app where you can pull up this sort of information for your particular area and, and have a think about what the long-term patterns mean for your management strategies and, and the way you um, set the herd up. Um, there's plenty of situations where control mating is not practical, such as country that's hard to muster or very poor country where it really is a constant struggle to keep condition on cows to make control mating work. Um, but there are options to handle um, or improve our ability to manage the body condition, and that's breeder segregation, um, because it's all about what we do with those out of season calving cows. Is there a better way to manage them? And in a year round mated herd, the animals that are dry on that first round of mustering, say March, April, May, they're the ones that are going to be the problem out of season carvers, the ones that carve in May, June, July, and August maybe, and have that very long haul through to the seasonal break. So if we segregate animals on lactation and or pregnancy status, we've got an opportunity to manage um, them better and reduce our supplement costs. Uh, pregnancy testing, putting animals into segregation groups also means that we can make decisions about out of season um, aged cows. Some of these animals, if you're facing a very light year, you're probably better off selling them, particularly on the current market, than taking the risk of them calving out of season and you potentially having to spend a lot of money on them. And we can also reduce our supplement costs by better targeting of it, because those animals that have their calf weaned off them on the first round, they can probably get through a lot of the dry season um, without any supplement, whereas those that are calving in May or April, we're probably looking at a relatively long period when they are going to potentially need our supplement. And segregation can be very simple or relatively complex. And it, you know, the simple starting point is that first round wet and dry draft. Um, the dry group is where the problems are. So even if you just get them off on their own without a pregnancy test, you've got a group you can start to do something with. Um, this diagram here just shows, you know, the myriad of options that, you know, people use with segregation. So on our first round here, we've got a wet cow group, which comprises wet cows with a calf at foot and the weaner mothers, those that had the weaner taken off, and then we've got our dry group. So some people pregnancy test them and put them into, um, calving groups. 
Um, some people just, you know, let them go through and maybe preg test them on the second round. Um, with these wet cow group, um, often people don't want to pregnancy test them on the first round because you've got the issue of mothering up. But on the second round, you're going to wean all those calves that you branded on the first round and you could use a pregnancy test at that point to put them into calving groups. But what it's about is getting animals into groups um, according to their nutritional requirements and, um, and lactation status. So, you know, an animal that isn't going to calve till October, December or January to April, it's quite possible they could go through the whole dry season with no supplementation at all. Whereas these ones that carve here in June, September, they're the ones that are potentially up for a lot of supplementation. So in summary, um, I think the key points out of all this is that cows lactating in the dry season will always be on a below maintenance diet. We want to carve breeders in store condition or better to give us the best chance of getting good conception rates and avoiding um, you know, drought risk, welfare risk. Um, good breeder management, which is um, as well as stocking rate, but time of weaning, um, selection of paddocks for different classes of animals, that can go a long way to cause to reducing our supplement requirements. Um, weaning is our most important tool after stocking rate because when we wean the cow, we effectively cut her energy requirement in half and that makes an enormous difference to her ability to um, maintain condition on poor quality feed. Um, there's good climate data out there that you can help um, plan um, joining times to try and set your herd up in, in a pattern that best suits the environment you're operating in. And the breeder segregation is a pretty valuable tool for um, managing the outer season carvers, both nutritionally and also just the general handling the herd when, when you're going to have to go in and, and wean out of season calves. Um, so um, extra support, um, our Future Beef website has a lot of good resources on all these topics. You can get in touch with your extension officers through our call centre. And as I mentioned before, they we're having some workshops coming up in CQ in Southern Queensland, and they're all listed now on the Future Beef event calendar. And our net webinar next week, we're going to go into the nuts and bolts of what's in different supplements and how you might go about choosing and managing um, a, a supplements to best suit your situation, both a dry season supplement, but also phosphorus supplements. So thanks very much and I'll hand you back to Greg.